Hello, you're on the road less traveled with Gary L. and Gigi's Boo on RealLibertyMedia.com, RLM Radio. Hello out there. Wow, Gigi's Boo, happy Easter. Happy Easter to you, too. Yeah, been Easter Sunday, for those of you who didn't know. <laughs> Easter Sunday, most of the world. And Gigi's Boo, I think you had a kind of a very interesting meal that you put together today. Yeah, I'm always, I love cookbooks, and and I think I told y'all in here in a show just a couple of weeks ago that for Valentine's Day, Gary gave me two cookbooks that I had searched high and low for. They were the old Good Housekeeping cookbooks. One was written, the first one was written in 1953, another one was written in 1960, and it was, they're very, very good. So I found a recipe that was eerily similar to what my grandmother used to fix. She used Knox gelatin, the unflavored gelatin, and I did my own thing with it. I did it like the gelatin box and added a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but I ended up doing cabbage, celery, bell pepper, onion, and to add a little color, I did pimentos, chopped up some pimentos. I mixed it all up and put it in a pretty mold. And it was so pretty, and it was so good. And it's had a little vinegar in it, and I added a little lemon juice, and everybody at church loved it. They're still eating it, and it's they wanted to keep it and take it home with them, and I told them to go ahead. And it was uh, very interesting, and everybody was wanting the recipe. And it's so funny that everything that I cook and take, they want the recipe, and I love recipe books, but Gary will tell you, I just cook off the top of my head. I do my own thing. Add to, take away from, make up my own recipes. So that was a very interesting morning, along with our service. And I came on and had to have a nap. I think Gary might have taken a nap, too. But so here we are. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here Graham, he is a nice guy. He's good to me. <laughs> and he And he really likes it. That I'm one of the women that don't like um, expensive baubles, as they say. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's the stuff that ends up in hawk shop. <laughs> no, no, not me. Plain gold band on my finger and my grandmother's diamond that's that I right. wear. But uh, no, I take the diamond off when I'm doing work. But mm -hmm. I don't like baubles. No baubles. Atticus will wear a bobble, but you have to watch him. He's oh, fun. gosh. He's funny that way. Oh, yeah. He's been out, and he's so, uh, I have got a funny Atticus story. My niece has got a sugar glider, and if y'all are not familiar what sugar gliders are, that's what we call a flying squirrel around here. So she brought the glider down here in a cage, and she opened it, and it jumped on my shoulder earlier today. I hadn't even got to tell Gary about that. And that thing jumped, and I thought Atticus and the dogs were going to go crazy. He was barking, standing up, trying to jump. He was just really upset. And so finally I got it. Of course, him barking scared the little squirrel, and we had to put it back in the cage. And I held it down and let him smell of it. And he'd look at it and smell of it, and then he'd look up at me like, that is not supposed to be in the house. And Melly, she hates rat and I'm pretty sure she thought, mm-hmm, here we go. I'm going to have me a good time in a minute. But that's Atticus' story. He he had to investigate that. Yeah, that's pretty funny. I'm, a hairy rat was to be a cat, but Atticus hates rats. And I don't, I don't know, that's a, that's an interesting combination of flying rat. That's yeah. <laughs> probably, what he was, probably what he was thinking. He said, get that flying rat off of you. What's the matter yeah. with you? <laughs> Yeah, that's probably what he said. He probably, the time you washed his mouth out with soap for eating on that rat. Oh, gosh, I brushed his teeth and everything. He gosh. Was, he was probably thinking, uh-huh, where's the soap? I'm going to wash your <laughs> mouth out with. 
<laughs> I found a great way to brush his teeth. I take um, unfluoride toothpaste, and I first brush them with chicken broth, so he'll get used. To it. Then I hold him down and I do the unfluoride toothpaste, and he spits and he shakes his head, and then we take a rag and get as much of it as I can. Then I do the uh, chicken broth again, and he doesn't mind that. But he hates to get those teeth brushed. We do it once a week. Yeah. He hates that. <laughs> Sal said Atticus Adventures. I think you got a, a clip of one of his. Uh, yeah, he was singing. Atticus, Atticus is a dog. He's a dog, friend slave. He's a dog. He's a cocker spaniel. He's black, a hot mess. Black in color. <laughs> The black hole. The black hole, as Hal calls him, because you take his picture and there's nothing but a black hole standing in the room, <laughs> absorbing all free light frequencies. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it, it occurred to me that today, you know, being Easter and all, I think people have gotten so used to New Year's being the, uh, the you know, the idea of New Year's resolutions and being the when we're going to announce the changes in the world. <clears throat> the changes may be in our own personal world. But it strikes me that for a lot of reasons, maybe Easter might be a little more of an appropriate time to do that because, after all, it is the signals the start of the growing season when things start to come back to life. And I can't think of a better time to maybe change some of the thoughts and some of the actions and some of the plans to try something new, try something different. And why not that be the demarcation point for that? That's why it kind of occurred to me. And then along with that, it occurred to me that all through the year and all through the broadcasts, and this is this is kind of true, I guess, for most everyone, we get caught up in all this crazy events in the world, and which amounts to negativity. We get caught up in all this negativity. Uh, school shootings, and they're going to come take your guns away, and, you know, then we're going to have all these... Trump versus whatever's and you know people this and people that and everything in an uproar and this uproar does nothing but steal our energy wouldn't you agree with that GD Spoo? I agree with that 100% steals our energy when our energy should probably be better spent trying to improve our situations improve ourselves improve our conditions if we can the positive things that we might be able to do in life and make contributions as an actualized human being, make positive contributions to the local network or the local society or the family or however you want to look at it. And that's not going to make all this necessarily, anyway, make all these bad things go away, but at least we won't have lost our energy as the result of becoming so entangled, so psychologically entangled in these events. And don't you think maybe that's part of the agenda that's going on? You know, we look at the, oh, the, the war on the family. That's been going on for some time. And now we have the war on our own identities. And now we have this attack on our own individualism. We can now choose to identify... I can identify as being that Fender jazz bass that's sitting in the corner. Yeah, I can change myself in having four strings. And that would probably be most appropriate since someone else is trying to play it. You know, you look at this, and this is all part of losing touch with who we are. Losing touch with our innermost being and all the energies that not only we have within us, but that exists outside of us and inside of us simultaneously. So we see all these things, and it can be a very positive and wonderful experience. And some of the things, <laughs> um, a lot going on in the chat room here. I didn't say anything about that, but anyway, a lot of the things that we see happening in the world, and historically, a lot of things have happened that we just don't understand we kind of set them to the side because our logical minds are, I guess that's our right brains, our right brains can't make sense out of it, so we set it off to the side. But it's in this one article that I found from Florida State University, you know, we talk about this, people say they have a sixth sense. People say 
that they get gut feelings about things, you know, and a lot of times their right brain <laughs> will say, ah, that doesn't make a lot of sense, something you can't see, hear, feel, touch, smell, but you're getting a feeling about it. Well, it turns out at Florida State, they did some research, neuroscientists did some research, and discovered that there may, in fact, be validity to this idea of gut feelings. I know there is. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm going to turn this over to you in a minute <laughs> because I know you do. They had, and even if it's just subconscious, and we talk about the professor who led this research, Linda Renneman, found that the gut to brain signals are a powerful influence on emotions, mood, and decisions, typically by prompting you to avoid certain situations. So that little voice, it speaks to you. That tells you, nah, I probably don't want to do this. I don't know why. I just got a feeling that's probably not the right thing to do. But it turns out that gut brain pathway, being very similar across all species, from mouse, from meses to humans and flying squirrels, they are very, very similar. And so they studied animals to see how the gastrointestinal functions contribute to both normal and abnormal mental functions. The brain and the gut, apparently, are always talking to one another via something called the vagus nerve. Gigi's boo knows what that is. Oh, yeah. It's a sprawling two-way network connecting the brain to the gastrointestinal tract. Has to the heart. To the heart. Yeah. Well, it connect, also to the heart. Yeah, it connects a lot. I'm, yeah, I'll get there. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Which has an enormous surface area and a lot of sensors. The GI tract is more than 100 times larger than the surface of the skin and sends more signals to the brain than any other organ system in the body. It's also known as the wandering nerve because it wanders through the chest and abdomen, monitoring and controlling digestion, heart rate, blood pressure, immune function, and hormone levels. It's the longest of the dozen cranial nerves and operates in a two-way circuit that carries the top-down messages from the brain to the body as well as bottom-up messages commonly described as gut feelings. Now, Judy's boo, talk about the vagus nerve a little bit from an anatomical perspective. Well, the vagus nerve does control it. It even controls respiration. It goes as far as the medulla, the primitive brain. It takes care of the heart. It goes, takes care of the intestinal tract, and it controls the anus. We were taught in nursing school to be very careful when people had impactions and we had to break them up because if you stimulate that vagus nerve too much, you can cause people to have a heart attack. Now, how many of y'all have heard of people, they say, well, we found them and they were dead sitting on the toilet. They died going to the bathroom. They stimulated that vagus nerve and it caused them to have a heart attack. If you think about it, where it goes to the primitive brain, And the brain feeds to the fight or flight, the synapsis part. Have you ever noticed that when you get really scared, you hear people say, that scared the shit out of me? It stimulated that vagus nerve that stimulated that tummy. And that tummy got stimulated. And that tummy stimulated the anal sphincter. So it all ties in together. Right. It's a remarkable nerve. When the human body was formed, it's, it's a remarkable anatomically wonderful specimen. That's all I can say about us. So this gives great support to the idea that things like glyphosate and all the other chemicals that are associated within the the glyphosate products have very harsh effects on the gut and on the gut flora and how this will affect your psychological well-being and how it affects the perceptions that you have of things you're typing boo-boo. And I'm sorry, I had to answer Hale. I'm sorry. I'll mute next time. Excuse okay. me, my darling. <laughs> Those are hard to edit out. This is, this I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, I'm, not, I'm just picking. I'm just picky. I know that. you are. I'm just picky. Anyway, we see all these things going on. And there again, we look at all the stuff that's surrounding us, this negativity that's designed to take our energy away from us and our ability to interact with our environment appropriately so we see all this going on and i don't believe it's an accident i don't for a minute believe it's an accident it's a well thought out and a very well orchestrated and powerfully supported 
operation against people. And it's probably been going on forever under different names and different titles and all these sorts of things. But now it's technologically underwritten. It's technology that is driving us apart. This technology that is trying to substitute itself for actual uh, personal interactions. Who is that? <laughs> oh, Lord, don't start. <laughs> doing a shift. Be quiet. Daddy's doing a shift. <laughs> Anyway, so we're seeing these things trying to supplant all these natural interactions that we have in community and family and even within our own minds, within ourselves and the energy that ebbs and flows. That's not an accident. We see the transhumanistic agenda. That's all part of trying to make technology interface with the human being. And they even have these things going on about trying to create artificial intelligence and consciousness in the same bottle, if you will. I personally don't think that's going to happen. And the reason I don't think it's because I think consciousness resides outside your body, not inside your body. I think it's an energetic connection that exists outside. And I just don't see us bottling individual consciousness. Don't see it happening. Could be wrong. It doesn't make sense to me. Any thoughts on that, Gigi? Yeah, I think it's a lot of things can be tried and attributed to the surroundings, but the conscious, I think, is an outside influence, but it also is in the spirit. I think you and I differ a little bit on that. If you didn't have conscious, how would you know that you were doing something wrong? How would you know that what you were doing was right? Not because you're taught, more of the feeling that you have. Now, could that be outside influence? Yes, but I think a lot of it is inside too. Now, to me, that's just mine and your differences on how we think. I don't think we differ that much on that point. I've always felt like that and there are two things going on. You have a, and I'm just, this, you know, people are going to get tangled up on the semantics here, but try to take in what I'm putting out here. In my mind, you have a spirit that is unique to your body. To your, right. You mm-hmm. have a spirit. But there's also a soul that mm-hmm. is separate and apart from that spirit. And that soul, for lack of a better word, is what connects all things, everything. Mm-hmm. So there are two entirely different things going on. that They're designed to operate in harmony with one another. And the whole agenda here is to disrupt that harmonious interaction. And so you might be able to capture the essence of a spirit, but you're not going to capture a soul because the soul is all-inclusive of all things. Mm -hmm. That's how we're all connected. I think this whole gut study kind of plays along those lines. They state the types of bacteria in your gut are shaped by your diet, and those bacteria can affect your emotional and cognitive state. Evidence shows that modifying your diet, perhaps by consuming probiotics, can impact your mood and behavioral states. It's very clear in animal and human studies, but how does it work? Does it involve a microbiome that you feed in your gut, or how do those bacteria send signals back to the brain through the vagus nerve? That area of research has exploded in the last few years, and currently there are many more questions than there are answers. It's also unclear why treatment using electrical stimulation of the vagus nerve helps alleviate clinical depression. Approved for patients who don't respond well to prescription drugs or other therapies, vagal nerve stimulation changes the signals received by the brain and can have a positive impact. Scientists don't understand how or why it works, but its effectiveness generates more motivation for researchers like Renneman. Well, okay, we are electrical beings. Exactly. And you don't tell me you're not frying a little bit of that nerve when they do that electrical stimulus to you. Well, yeah, but we are electrical beings, so it makes very good sense that managing our electrical field, for lack of a better Uh description, is a way to address certain issues, certain certain diseases, certain problems. And that also works in reverse. (laughs) You can manipulate your electrical field negatively, for example, through pulsed super high frequency signals from 5g that can have negative impacts and don't don't dismiss what i say because there are at least 500 studies that underscore that 
people never told you about. And they're not going to tell you about it. But that's a whole other. That's a whole other topic. It's just part of the deconstruction of humanity, which I guess is the right way to say it. But some of the things that have happened in the world are hard to explain. You are right brain anyway. Are hard to explain. Like you know, we hear about miracles, and Gigi's Boo and I were talking about this. People call these things that they can't explain. They call them miracles. Are they miracles, or are they part of that interconnective force that we share with each other and with creation, actually, with a higher level of force, for, for lack of a better label? So what about some of these things that have happened? This is a really strange one. It's unbelievable how many unusual, unexplainable, miraculous events that have occurred that People have just put on the shelf because, you know, you don't know what. Here's one in March of 2015. Lynn Grossbeck, who was 25 years old, lost control of her car and landed in the icy Spanish Fork River in Utah. Now, some of you guys up in that part of the world are probably familiar with where that is. Fourteen hours later, first responders found her 18-month-old daughter, Lily, in her car seat, hanging upside down just above the frigid water. But prior to finding Lily, both police officers and firefighters reported that they heard an adult voice yell, Help me, from inside the car. They discovered that the voice could not have come from the young mother who had died from the impact, so they couldn't explain the voice or how the girl survived hanging upside down for 14 hours in freezing temperatures and wasn't even dressed for the cold weather. What do you think about that, Judy's Boo? Well, again, there you go. That's one of those unexplainable miracles. It could have been an angel. If you believe in angels, if you don't, then that's okay. We're not going to get mad over it. But something was there to alert the firefighters. It wasn't so much in their spirit as it are they their interference as we call it as it had to be an outside interference right. call it what you want to call it what you want to angels the voice of god whatever you perceive him to be but people are alerted on uh, different things to me that was a miracle right there that the baby made it hanging upside down think about the blood flow and all that. That was a miracle right there. Think about hanging upside down that long and the circulation of the blood. It's not supposed to circulate with you hanging upside down that long. It does damage. So therefore, the child was fine. She just needed to be found. People think, well, that, you know, why? Well, yeah, that these things happen more frequently <laughs> than, than are talked about. And you've had, I'm sure, personal experiences that way from your medical experience, Judy's Boo. Is that true? That's very true. Personally, I've had an experience. I was going out of the house one day, and we really didn't at that time live on a busy road. We do now. And I was going to step out into the road, just step out into the road because I had my head down. And something just as plain said, stop. And I stopped. I didn't step down. And here came a car, and it was flying. I would have been killed. And another time, we had a lightning strike that hit the house, and I unplugged all the sewing machines, and I was standing in front of a little small TV that I had in my sewing room where I watched when I worked, and I was sweeping, and I heard a voice say, move, move now, just like that, and I moved, and when I did, the whole room lit up blue, and I thought for a split second, this is it. I am dead. It blew the TV out where I was in front of, just blew the whole front out. There's no telling what would have happened to me if it had hit me. But I heard it. It said, move, move now. Just real urgent. And I moved. I paid attention. I also have these things, and I'll be talking to Gary, and we'll be discussing things. And he'll say, we neither one do anything without talking to the other one. Anything majorly important. Some people wouldn't think that it's important, but Gary and I, we do. 
and Gary and I will be talking, and we'll look at something. We'll be looking at something on the Internet, or we'll be thinking about buying something. And I actually, if I'm not supposed to do something, and Gary listens to me, and I listen to him, but I actually feel that feeling in my gut, and it hits me in my stomach, and it tightens up. And if I don't listen to that and I go ahead and do against what that gut tells me to do, I'm in trouble. I usually get in trouble. And I say, Gary, my gut tells me we better not do this. He said, okay. And then sometimes his gut will speak to him. And he doesn't exactly say it's his gut. He'll say, boo, something's just saying maybe we ought not to do this. We were really, really thinking of moving one time. And something just didn't seem right. And so we both just sat on it. And I'm glad we did. I'm glad we sat on that. We didn't move. Uh, we think things through. So I think everybody has that to a certain extent. I don't know about you all, but Gary and I do. I don't mean to take over. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. You're doing fine. That's really good. And I, it's just your description. And <clears throat> we were talking earlier about the difference between the spirit and the soul. Well, to me, the the pathway, the communication network, if you will, is that soul thing, <laughs> you know, and how that information is coming to you, that's your personal belief system, but that information exists and that does come to you. I know, I'll talk about something I know a whole lot about is my son was during back right before, right before, good timing, we decided to go over and and uh, get involved in Saddam Hussein, Iraq, and all that. He had joined the military, and it's always a curse. <laughs> you think, a lot of people think, well, your kids will grow up and follow in your footsteps, but sometimes that's not always such a pleasant thing for you to experience them doing. But at any rate, so he wound up being part of the 173rd Airborne, which is a special operations capable unit which means they do things in support of special ops. And turns out that they were involved in the invasion of Iraq, his unit specifically. They did the very first night jump ever out of a C-9 aircraft. And so they did night jump into Iraq. And long story short, ended up on the first combat patrol. Nate, my son, he was the first to notice that there were Iraqis on the buildings at night, it's nighttime, we're in night vision, and he was the first to notice. He warned everyone else who took cover as the gunfire opened up. During this firefight, of course, people drop down to reload and then will come back up and engage. They found cover behind this wall, and in Iraq, all these buildings had these short walls around them. And so he found a cover behind that wall and would drop down to reload, but on one occasion, when he dropped down to reload, he told me that he found that he was unable to stand up, that there was the, the distinct pressure of two hands on his shoulders that holding him down. And he even looked around to see who was behind him. There was no one there. But there were two hands holding him down for just for maybe a second or two. But then when the hands released and he started to stand up, that's when heavy machine gun fire ripped the top off of that wall which would have been at his face level so these things do happen we're not heavily religious people but there's no question that that occurred he's not going to be one to make up some kind of story like that he was so overwhelmed and impressed by the experience i think it changed the way he looked at the world any thoughts on that ggsb we're not really what you say religious fanatics but I, I do believe when Gary told me that, I did feel that it was a heavenly presence that was taking care of him. Yep. And I really think that Gary had a little predisposition to that. Tell him about you on the paper route. Gary had a premonition about his son, and he was delivering papers. And as well as I can remember, he wrote little notes and put into the paper and told him that his son was overseas and it was a pretty rough assignment that he was on and to please pray for him. And Gary says, I do believe that a lot of people were praying and the prayers helped. Yeah. Keep my son safe. Yeah. Talk about the power of intention, a mass intention and power of prayer. 
I think all these things are essentially tied to the very same dynamic. And it's interesting how it has these impacts. In fact, there are some stories I came across that, that speak to that. But here's one particular story. We talked about miracles. That there was a 40-year-old lady. She fell unconscious from a rare amniotic fluid embolism during a cesarean section in Boca Raton, Florida. The doctors tried to revive her for three hours. After 45 minutes without a pulse, doctors decided to invite her family into the operating room to say their last goodbyes. Then what doctors are calling a miracle happened. Her heart began beating on its own. The lady revealed that during the experience, she felt herself floating along a tunnel and seeing spiritual beings, including her father, surrounded in light. What's even more incredible, that she suffered no brain damage and made a full recovery, and also her baby girl is healthy and happy. Have you ever seen anything like that, Judy? Oh, yeah. Several times. I've actually had people who passed away. The heart stopped for a while, and they were able to come back and tell us what they saw. And it's amazing that most all the stories are the same. They all relate to the same. And somebody said, well, they're really kind of, they're picking up on what other people say. I don't believe that. I really don't. I think it's simply that they're seeing what we can't see. We had a gentleman, I was working the ER that day, and a gentleman came in, and never have I seen it since then. This was truly a miracle. The gentleman said that he presented with chest pain, and his color was terrible. He drove himself to the hospital. He said that he had felt bad pretty much all day, but he said, I really, really, really feel terrible, and I came on. And his color was actually blue. They did an ultrasound, started IVs. We worked on him and everything. And the left side of his heart had blown. You don't see anybody live from a blown out heart like that from the left side, right side, upper or lower, either way. So we called the chopper and they, they, they were bringing him in. We were going to chop him out to a larger hospital. And he looked up at me and said, please tell my wife that I love her and that we have had a wonderful life together, that I love the children and her, but I'm not going to make it. Will you please tell her when she gets here? And, of course, I told him I would, and after the chopper flew him out, we were waiting on her to get there. And when she came in, I told her word for word what to say, and I said, he's in the larger hospital in the next town. And so she went over. And about four months later, I got to see the gentleman. He survived that. And he told me, he said, I never thought that I was going to live. And he said, I wanted to say the things that I could say. And he said, but I remember one thing that you said, and I do not remember saying this. I do not remember saying this to him. He said, when I was laying there and I had told you everything to say to my wife, he said, you had my hand and you squeezed it. And you said, Creator God of all the universe, help this man to live for his family. That broke me up. It still breaks me up. There's heavenly presence all around us. My grandfather died. That death really did something to me. I was named after his baby sister that died when she was about eight or nine years old. He was crippled up. And he appeared to me and my mother both. And everybody said I was asleep. I was not asleep. I had laid down. I was watching TV, and I blinked my eye. And when I looked back, there stood my granddaddy. And I stood up, and I said, Granddaddy, Granddaddy. And he smiled at me. He looked like he did maybe from the pictures that I've seen him in his mid-30s to early 40s, healthy. And he smiled. And when I reached for him, he dissipated like fog. I've had people to tell me that I was dreaming. I was not dreaming. I had people to tell me that I was hallucinating. I was not hallucinating. I saw my grandfather. There's lots of things that you can see. Now, my mother had an experience when she was a child. Her best friend, excuse me, crying a little bit. She had a friend, and he was one of the first patients. They did the heart surgery on children. This would have been in about 
60, 61, I think. And she woke up in the middle of the night and she looked down the road to where they lived and she saw three angels. And she said they were majestic. They were not small. She said they were tall as buildings with three stories and there were three of them and they were hovered over his home place where his family lived. So she woke up the next morning and her daddy, she said, where's uh, my mama? And she said, she's gone down because your friends passed away. And she said, I looked at him and said, I know it. I know. I know he's gone. And he said, how do you know? And he said, she said, I saw three angels over his house. So we see these things, God, whatever you can conceive him to be, the supernatural, whatever you conceive it to be, however you want to describe it. We're able to see these. I think we're given glimpses to reassure us of things and to let us know that things will be okay, even when we don't think they will. Things will be okay. I've got to stop a little bit, Gary. Okay. As we were talking about the, the power of community, this particular story is quite an example of it. So the end of Grayson Kirby seemed inevitable when he was thrown from a demolition derby car at the Mid-Atlantic Power Festival at Rutgersville, Virginia, in June 2014. The accident left him in a coma. His lungs were crushed, and nearly every bone in his body was broken. His brain also suffered multiple strokes and hemorrhages, and his kidneys were failing. If he did wake up, he would likely, to put it bluntly, be a vegetable. But his family refused to give up and turned to prayer. Thousands of people in the community and beyond kept Kirby in their thoughts and prayers and wore red shirts designed to show support for the injured man. In a final attempt to revive Kirby, doctors hooked him up to a machine typically used for transplant patients, not trauma patients. Whether it was due to a divine intervention or medical intervention or both, it worked. Ten days after the accident, Kirby opened his eyes and mouthed the words, I love you, to his father. The doctors couldn't believe it, and neither could Kirby. He said, I'm humble, I'm grateful, just amazed. I know that prayer and believing saved me. That's a pretty powerful story. Don't you think, Jesus? I do. I do. There was a study done. You know, a lot of doctors are agnostics. Science to them is more powerful than creation, uh, God. This one Christian doctor worked in the ICU, and he did a study. It was published that he had his congregation, which was a pretty large church he went to, to pray for half the people in the ICU and the other half not to pray. And the half that were prayed for got better quicker. Their hospital stay in ICU was cut like two days to where the others was three and four. So power of prayer works. It's a miraculous thing to be prayed for when you need it. Yeah, absolutely. Power of Some people call it the power of intention. It's essentially, it's all the same thing, really. You're reaching outside of yourself, as we talked about earlier about the power that exists, the energy that exists both inside and outside of us. We focus that energy. Really no different mechanically as focusing a light from the sun through a magnifying glass onto an old dried leaf and watch it burn a hole right through it. It's all the same thing. And as we're continually distracted and disturbed and negative emotions flow around us, that interferes with that signal. It's like, it's like a jamming. And, and this this is all being done intentionally, in my opinion. It's all an intentional effort to take our power away from us, not only as separate people, but also as groups, as focused groups. It takes our power away and distracts us and puts us on all these crazy rabbit runs that we end up on. Unfortunately, those are the kinds of stories that people want to hear about. They want to hear about the sensational and they don't want to really want to hear too much about these miracles, do they, Judy's Boo? Oh, no. No, 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 no. Doctor and I got into a nice conversation, and he said, I, I just don't understand, Brenda, why you believe in all this God stuff and this, that, and the other. And I said, well, I just do. I said, how can you look at the earth around you and not believe the things, the magnitude of the beauty of stuff and not believe in a supreme being? He said, well, we... 
just for some amino acid. And we slithered out of the ocean and started walking. We evolved. And I said, who made the amino acid? He said, it was just there. It was in the water. I said, who made the water? Where did it come from? He said, the Big Bang. I said, who caused the Big Bang? He said, shut up, Brenna. I'm not going to win this argument with you. I see it already. I said, that's true. You're not. Well, it's not really an argument. You're basing comments in fact and logic. And it's something that we talked about on yesterday's discussion video, Suspect Sky. I went out on the limb. I'd bring up something about all these advanced civilizations that might exist out there, how they looked at us. They, they would appear to be as gods. And my point was that it may be gods with a little g, but there still is whatever it is, and it's God with a big G because you can see the, the fingerprint of it in everything, especially you start looking at the Fibonacci sequence, start looking at the uh, golden ratio, you start looking at the importance of frequency, energy, and vibration, the threes, the sixes, and the nines, and all of that is throughout nature. You can see the golden ratio in just about everything, if you look closely, in spiral nebula down to the DNA, it's all there and it's all consistent. And that is overwhelming evidence of the existence of a larger force, a larger power, a self-replicating system that it runs fine. Some people call it natural, you know, nature and all that. And it is. It runs fine. What exactly it is? That's up to your individual discernment, what you want to call it. But it's there, and, it's, and as, we, as we accept the fact that it's there, whatever you want to call it, that empowers us both individually and as groups to do great positive things because we understand the nature of the universe is balance. There's good and there's evil, and that's by design. There's balance. There's left, right, if some people you know, call it uh, yin and yang. It's there. It's important. There's going to be bad things because there are good things to counterbalance the bad things and vice versa. We have to understand that relationship. And once we understand that, it, it kind of answers a lot of questions in our minds. Uh, what, do you, what's your, what are your thoughts on that, Judy Smith? Oh, very complicated. I can't do it right now. Okay. It is a complicated thing, and I guess as we start heading toward the tail end here, there's one event <laughs> that this one... I'm, do... I'm sorry, y'all, that th this is a touchy situation with me. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Gary. No, oh, what, what was touchy? I'm sorry. You know, talking about my grandfather and things like oh, that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. That in itself is indicative of the power that is involved with it. It has, you know, we were talking earlier about... Uh, how the gut feelings and so forth. How mm -hmm. how many things we perceive through all the various ways that our bodies are designed, designed with all kinds of receptors to pick up all kinds of things. I mean, we talk about Native Americans, well, their long hair, they wore their hair long because it was actually an extension of the central nervous system, right, Gigi Booth? Yes, and it was very religious, too. Right. And these things, this is where this is where things get all muddled up because the acceptance and the realization of these natural, miraculous things, characteristics in the world, we somehow dismiss because some someone has told us that, well, that's all religious bullshit. That's not. It's natural. It's out there. It's real. It's like you say, it's a, it's a complex topic, but it's something that once you come to understand the world within which you live and all the energies that surround us, it's kind of reassuring in a way, and some people call that faith. Well, I think that is exactly what it is. It's faith, faith based on understanding, not blind faith. That blind faith is something entirely different. That's kind of like hopes and dreams and all that stuff, but the faith based on rationality that we know these things exist and they exist they always have and probably always will and we are part of that we are all connected in that if we choose to be connected if we're not distracted and pulled away and turned in different directions pulled away from some people call the truth then i think that is the truth the truth is our existence and our interdependent existence is our truth 
Then let's close up on a final story here, Gigi's Boo. Okay. This lady back in 1971, so a few of you out there <laughs> will probably remember this. Julian Kepke, German girl, survived a plane crash in the Peruvian jungle. Christmas Eve of all days, 1971, a half hour after takeoff from Lima Airport, Lima, Peru, a passenger plane bound for Pucallpa in the Amazon rainforest flew into a thunderstorm. The plane started lurching and bumping in the air. Then a single catastrophic moment, a bolt of lightning hit one of the fuel tanks and tore the right wing off. Lanza Flight 508 went into a nosedive and all 92 of his passengers or crew were killed. All except for one. Julianne Kepke, who was 17, was sitting in the window seat next to her mother. And the next thing she knew, she was falling through the air, still strapped to her seat and her mother had vanished. The filmmaker who made a documentary on this, and I have a link for it, it's on YouTube for free, Werner Herzog, who some 30 years later was to make a documentary, said she did not leave the, the airplane. The airplane left her. She said she remembered falling headfirst with the seatbelt digging into her stomach and a canopy of trees spiraling toward her. Then she lost consciousness. She came to the next morning on the floor of the rainforest. She has somehow had managed to drop two miles through the air and not only survived but walked away with apparently nothing more than a concussion, a broken collarbone, a cut on her leg, and a small cut on her arm. She fell for two miles and lived. Obviously, the canopy probably broke her fall, but she was falling head first. Pretty miraculous in my mind. But that wasn't the end of her problems. That was only the beginning because now she was lost in the Amazon. And there was danger everywhere from dragon, I'm sorry, dragon, <laughs> from jaguars, scorpions, and poison, <laughs> poisonous snakes camouflaged as leaves. It might as well have been dragons, right? Well, she couldn't see because she had lost her glasses. I mean, how much worse can this get? And, of course, then you have the rivers full of piranhas and alligators. And that's in December. The rainforest is wet down there. So, she was covered with bugs during the day, and at night she was lashed with ice-cold rain. Then, what'd she have with her? She was just a girl in a thin cotton mini-dress with a broken zipper and one white sandal. The other one got lost somewhere along the way in a crash. She had nothing to eat but a bag of boiled sweets, which ran out on day four. And she had a simple belief that she had to keep going. But ten days after the plane crashed, she was found by three forest workers. What an amazing story. It's Yes, it is. Uh, what do you think about that, Jesus? Boo? Miracle. Miracle. That's all you can call it. Two miles. Think about that. I had a World War II vet tell me one time that one of his friends, they were paratroopers, and they jumped out, and one of them shoot did not open, and he said that when he went in to, to view the body before the family did, there was not a bit of blood on him anywhere, but his legs had come up into his chest, and he no longer had an abdomen. All he had was a chest and two legs and feet, and they had a hard time, I guess, getting him ready for the family to you know, send him home. But he said that stayed with him his entire life. Can you imagine seeing that? Yeah, that's, that's pretty out there, boo boo. <laughs> and speaking of out, I guess we're about out of time. It's 7.59 on this Easter Sunday. A little bit of a change of pace on the road less travel. Hope everyone enjoyed this. And think about some of these things. So easy to be drawn away from what defines us as people and get tangled up in all this crazy stuff that goes on, mostly by design. <laughs> it was designed to manipulate you and control you and and harvest you in many different ways. Mm -hmm. So give it a thought as we start our spring, as we start, to me, a new year. And join us again next week. Gigi's Boo, what, what you got to say? Remember to take the road less travel, and I love you all big to my heart. 
Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for that. And thanks so much for showing up. We didn't give credit to the chat room. A lot of people talking in there tonight. We appreciate that you did come. And those of you who are listening on Archive, appreciate you checking us out. And, oh, by the way, go over to freedomsnetwork.com, throw them a little bit of money. They're in a heck of a mess as far as trying to pay the bills for this year's website fees. So anything you can do, throw them a bone, please. I'll put a link in the blogcaster. Anyway, take care, and we'll catch up with you next week here on The Road Less Traveled. Bye-bye. Thank you.